Today's topic is positive definite matrices. It falls into a number of parts. The first part will talk about quadratic forms, essentially polynomials of degree 2, orthogonal decomposition of a quadratic form, and finally some tests and our takeaway. So let's start with the definition. A quadratic form is a function of a vector x that is a homogeneous polynomial of degree 2, and what that means is I have variables x1 through xn, and the only types of terms I have in my polynomial are of the form alpha xi xj, so degree 2. Examples, just to fix our ideas, here is a polynomial in two variables, x and y, and it's written in function form for the individual variables, 3x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. The second example, 3x squared minus 2xy. I don't necessarily have to have all of the terms appearing in the polynomial. I don't even have all of the variables appear in the polynomial. So, for example, here, a function of x and y, that's only got the term 3x squared. Or more generally, this time a vector in vector notation, a polynomial that has three variables associated with it. Now, the remarks are that not all terms alpha, xi, xj need to appear, that we have the usual functional notation where I explicitly enumerate the variables, and the functional notation where the variable is written in vector form. There are two problems associated with uh, these types of polynomials, and it's easier to talk about examples. So, let me show you two quadratic forms first. Let me show you plots of uh, two examples. So, let us look at the function f of xy equals x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared. We will plot this function and we'll show a cross-section. Uh, so, for example, we'll look at x squared plus 2xy plus 3y squared equal to 10. Uh, this is what it looks like. I have essentially uh, a bowl shape that opens up toward the top as I rotate through it. And what I did is I cut it in various places. So right now the cut level is here, this green plane at the very bottom. And if I look at it from above, you'll see that it just touches the surface at the level z equals zero. As I change the level, I see this plane coming up higher. And if I look at the intersection, at the shape of the intersection, I see an ellipse. As I go higher, I will see this ellipse starting to grow more and more, but the exact shape will stay an ellipse throughout. So we will now look at the surface x squared plus 20xy plus 3y squared. So compared to what I had before, I'm now changing the xy term to have a larger contribution. The result is a very different surface. This time, what I see is a hyperbolic uh, with a saddle point. And if I look at the intersections, well, let me look at the above, from above, what I see is a hyperbola. Now, uh, there, uh, there are two problems, therefore, that are associated with those quadratic forms. The first one is an extremum problem. Does it have a maximum, a minimum, a saddle point? And so I can look at it as a function, w is equal to q of x, uh, and the plots we just saw were w is equal to some function of x and y. And when I look at quadratic forms and look for their critical points, uh, it, they have exactly one critical point at the origin. That is the derivative of q, partial derivative of q with respect to xi is zero, means that xi is equal to zero. So just the origin is a critical point. And for the critical point, we now have a, an extremum problem. Let's classify the crit uh, critical point. What is it? Is it a maximum, a minimum, or a saddle point? The other problem, I can again look at my function w is equal to qx, and I can look at the cross section. So what I'm doing is I'm fixing the value of w for some given value, uh, one, two, three, whatever. Um, and I'm asking, what does this uh, surface look like? What does this cross-section look like? To use linear algebra techniques on this problem, we have to reformulate quadratic functions in terms of matrices. 
And the way this goes is, let me give you an example with two variables first. Look at the following expression. When I multiply this out, I see that I get a quadratic equation, alpha x squared plus delta y squared. So the terms on the diagonal give me my squares. And then the off-diagonal terms, beta and gamma, give me the xy term. Uh, but it's a sum of these two terms. So uh, two things. One is, since this is a matrix equation, it comes out as a matrix, a value, inside a one by one matrix. So we are going to drop the identity of size one by one to simplify the notation. Uh, the other thing is the cross term, right? The cross term results from the off diagonal entries. We can choose the cross term, however, to make that matrix symmetric. So let me show you an example. Uh, the, the quadratic form is alpha x squared plus 4xy plus beta y squared. You can make up the 4xy by putting the 4 down below and 0 above, or I can split the 4 uh, in 1 and 3, or minus 1 and 5, or I can split it evenly. I can split half of the 4 uh, at the top and half at the, of the 4 uh, down below. And this matrix, when I split it evenly, is symmetric. And we already know that symmetric matrices are very nice. They do diagonalize, and they do diagonalize with orthogonal vectors and that orthogonality is going to play a role. In general, though, we can construct a matrix representation for any quadratic form, and we will always choose the symmetric representation because of its nice properties. So here's an example, a quadratic form that has three variables in it, and so uh, uh, three cross terms, the cross term for x1, x2, multiplies by 4, x1, x3 by 8, x2, x3 by minus 2. If I write this into a matrix, uh, this is what happens. The x terms, x1, x2, x3, there's an x1, x2, x3 in each row, and an x1, x2, x3 in each column. The intersection of those, that's where that corresponding cross term goes. So x1, x2 goes here across the matrix, and I split that 4 evenly into 2 and 2. The next term, x1, x3, goes here across the matrix, and I split the 8 into 4 and 4. And the final x2, x3 term, it goes here, and again I've split it evenly into minus 1 and minus 1, and I've represented my quadratic equation with a symmetric matrix. Uh, one comment to make, since I had all of these uh, different ways of uh, writing that same quadratic equation, is that I can always take one of these generic forms and make it symmetric. The trick is simply to form the average uh, of the matrix and its transpose. That is a symmetric matrix, and the uh, anti-symmetric matrix A minus the transpose of A, and if you add them up, you'll see that they indeed add up to the uh, matrix A. Uh, a plus is symmetric, A minus is anti-symmetric, and when I look at the uh, quadratic form for an anti-symmetric matrix, I find that it is equal to zero. Now, we know that we have all these different ways of writing the same quadratic equation, that I can simply split that uh, cross term however I want to uh, split it up. The remark that goes with that is that if I have some uh, general matrix A, I can always split it into two pieces where uh, the first piece is symmetric and the second piece is anti-symmetric. All I have to do for the symmetric piece is I average A and A transpose. So half of A plus A transpose. And for the anti-symmetric piece, it's one half A minus A transpose. And if you check, when you add the two up, you indeed get A again. Now, the important part about the anti-symmetric matrix is that the quadratic form for the anti-symmetric matrix, X transpose A minus X, is equal to zero. All it means, uh, since it's anti-symmetric, it has zeros on the diagonal, and then the values in it are split across with opposite signs, 2 and minus 2 
Uh, and therefore, when you multiply it out, you get zero out of it. So for any matrix, then, we can always take uh, x transpose ax and replace a with its symmetric part. So I'm going to use the fact that I chose the matrix to be symmetric uh, and exploit that. So let me show you the theory first. We have a symmetric. So we are guaranteed that A has an orthogonal decomposition, Q, lambda, and Q inverse is equal to Q transpose. So we are guaranteed we can always uh, write down that kind of, uh, that decomposition. And let me plug that into my quadratic form. Uh, so here, Q of X is X transpose AX. And what will make it click is that we're going to change our basis uh, to the basis of the eigenvectors in Q. So we'll set X equal to Q times a new coordinate vector X tilde. When I plug in, I get, well, X transpose AX now becomes uh, Q uh, X tilde transpose A Q X tilde. And that first term, I'll simply apply my transpose to rewrite it as X tilde transpose times Q transpose. Uh, and I still have AQX. And now when I substitute for A, A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose, plug it in, I see that uh, Q transpose Q uh, on the left, that that is I and therefore cancels out. Q transpose Q on the right is I and therefore cancels out. And I'm just left with a diagonal term. And when I multiply out that diagonal term, I see lambda x1 tilde squared, lambda x2 tilde squared, uh, etc. I only see the diagonal terms. There are no more cross terms. So no x1 tilde times x2 tilde, for example. So the magic of this substitution of using the orthonormal eigenvector basis is that when I substitute into my quadratic form, I no longer have any cross terms. Now, this only works uh, because uh, Q inverse is equal to Q transpose. So I can't uh, substitute A equals S lambda S inverse uh, for some arbitrary S uh, made up of eigenvectors. I have to have orthonormal eigenvectors for this to work out the way it did. Now, the other remark to make is that that means that from a geometric point of view, all that really has happened is I changed my coordinate system. I have not changed the surface. Geometrically, uh, it describes the same surface. So X transpose AX in my original coordinate system, and X tilde transpose lambda X tilde in my new coordinate system represent the same surface. Here the surface is an, a symmetric matrix A. Here my surface is a diagonal matrix lambda. Again, to emphasize, the algebraic relations are related by this change of coordinates. So, so this is the important point, but that's we really got that simplification going. Uh, the other point to make is that at the critical point, x equals zero in my substitution, x transpose x is equal to x tilde. When I solve, I find that the critical point is, again, the origin in my new coordinate system. A couple of examples next. So let's look at the following quadratic form. 3x1 squared plus 2x1 x2 plus 3x2 squared. When I write that into a matrix in matrix form, the matrix I find is 3, 1, 1, 3, a 2 by 2 symmetric matrix. And the next step I have to do, therefore, is I have to obtain the eigen decomposition and make it orthogonal. So I'll have to find the eigenvalues. And if you look, the rows add up to 4, 3 plus 1, three plus, uh, 1 plus 3. So lambda equals 4 is an eigenvalue. And I also know what the eigenvector would be. Uh, it would be 1, 1. But uh, all I really want right now is the eigenvalues. The second eigenvalue I get from the trace formula. I know the first eigenvalue, lambda equals uh, 4. Uh, the trace is 6. So 6 minus 4 is 2, my second eigenvalue. Now, I know that when I plug in uh, x equals q x tilde, and I haven't computed q, I just know it exists. I know that when I plug in, that what I'm going to get is first eigenvalue times x1 tilde squared plus second eigenvalue times x2 tilde squared. So in terms of my uh, 
my table, my table uh, representation, I have my lambdas with their multiplicities, and I have another level. I'm writing down what the quadratic form looks like uh, for this particular symmetric matrix. Just copy down the eigenvalue for x1 tilde squared, the other eigenvalue for x2 tilde squared. If I look at my extremum problem now, I've just done my substitution, and so my quadratic form now has the form 4x1 tilde squared plus 2x2 tilde squared, and uh, the critical point is at the origin. I see that at the origin, I'm at level 0, but away from the origin, it's a positive number. So an open ball, uh, kind of a surface, and so that critical point is a minimum for that open ball. If I look at my cross-section uh, problem, so what I'll do is uh, pick some value for uh, the height, uh, w. Uh, let's pick one. That's a typical value that we'd get. We can divide out any other uh, constant. But then what we see is 4x1 tilde squared plus 2x2 tilde squared equals 1, which we can recognize as an ellipse. And we can compute the intersections of the axis. For example, if I said x2 tilde equal to 0, I see x1 tilde equals plus or minus the square root of 1 over 4, so plus or minus uh, 1 half. And similarly, uh, the other intersection uh, is plus or minus square root of 2 over 2 uh, for uh, my major axis for the ellipse. If I want to uh, draw the ellipse with respect to the original axis, I also need the eigenvectors. Okay? I need to know what the substitution was. And so, since the rows of A added to 4, I know that 1, 1 was an eigenvector for eigenvalue 4. Applying QR to it is simply changing its length. So, here is my first eigenvector, and then the second eigenvector, square root of 2 over 2 minus 1, 1. And you can see that, yes, they're indeed orthogonal. And we can plot our ellipse with respect to Q1, Q2. So let me show you the plot. Uh, here is my ellipse, the x1 tilde axis, the x2 tilde axis, and I see a standard ellipse, the width over here. Uh, x1 is plus or minus uh, 1 half. In x2 tilde, it's plus or minus square root of 2 over 2, so 0. 0.7 something. When I want to draw this with respect to the original uh, coordinate system. I'll draw the coordinate system. I'll draw Q1 and Q2 on that coordinate system. And then I'll draw my ellipse with respect to Q1, Q2. Uh, so I'll superpose the two. As a second example, let's change things a little bit. Let's put some minus signs in. Minus 3x squared plus 2x1, x2 minus 3x squared. So here's my matrix. Minus 3, 1, 1, minus 3. When I do my eigen decomposition, uh, again, the rows this time add up to minus 2. So I have a first eigenvalue minus 2 and a second eigenvalue from the trace equal to minus 4. And so this time around, my quadratic form takes the form minus 2 times x1 uh, tilde squared, minus 4 x2 tilde squared. And, and I get that when I use the corresponding eigenvectors as basis vectors. So for my extremum problem now, my extremum problem says I have to look at minus 2 x1 uh, squared, minus 4 x2 tilde squared, with uh, my critical point at the origin, at x1 tilde equals 0, x2 tilde equals 0. And this time around, I see that my function at the origin is equal to zero. And as I move away from the origin, uh, I can only get negative numbers. Uh, this function is negative for any one point away from the origin. It, it looks like a uh, ball upside down. So this critical point is a maximum. So if instead I look at the cross-section problem, uh, my level curves now, well, I can only get negative values out of it. So let's, for example, look at u of x equals minus 1. When I plug that in and change the signs, I again see an ellipse. In fact, I see the same ellipse that I had before. So for my third example, 
let's again look at the slight variation. Uh, x1 squared plus 6x1, x2 plus x2 squared. And now my matrix looks like this, 1, 3, 3, 1. And again, I see an eigenvalue lambda equals 4. But this time, my second eigenvalue is equal to minus 2. And so when I uh, plug this in, my quadratic form on substitution x equals qx tilde becomes 4x tilde squared minus 2x tilde squared. There's a sign change between those two variables. And in terms of my two uh, problems, for my extremum problem, now I have a four, uh, qx tilde is equal to 4x1 squared minus 2x2 squared. At, at the origin, it's equal to 0. But now, uh, depending on which direction I move away from the origin, I can get positive numbers out of it or negative numbers out of it. So, for example, uh, if I plug in x1 tilde equals 0, x2 tilde equals 1, I get minus 2. Whereas if I walk in the direction 1, 0, if I go to 1, 0, I get uh, plus 4. I get a positive number. So... At the critical point, it's zero. Away from the critical point, I can either get positive or negative numbers. This is a saddle point. For the cross-section uh, problem, for example, if I look at level equals 1, 4x1 squared minus 2x2 squared equals 1, that is a hard problem. So now we've seen all three behaviors. We've seen maxima, we've seen minima, and we've seen saddle points come out of. Let's do a slightly bigger example. Uh, this time I have three variables, x1, x2, x3, and my quadratic polynomial works out to be this nice symmetric matrix. And by inspection, I can notice that if I subtract off two from that matrix, uh, the first row and the third row become identical. Uh, therefore, there will be a missing pivot for uh, that value, uh, lambda equals two, so two is an eigenvalue. The associated eigenvector, if I compute the null space, is minus 1, 0, 1. And since I know one of the eigenvalues, I can use the trace and the determinant to compute the remainder of the polynomial, of the characteristic polynomial. Lambda 2 plus lambda 3 works out to be 4 uh, from the trace, and lambda 2 times lambda 3 works out to be 2. And my characteristic polynomial, therefore, is uh, this expression, which has roots 2, and 2 plus square root of 2, 2 minus square root of 2. And if you look at those three numbers, they're all greater than 0. Square root of 2 is approximately 1.4, so 2 minus 1.4 is still a positive number. To compute the eigenvectors, to find the axis uh, for my uh, surface here, well, I already have a basis for lambda equals 2. I can do the other two in a single uh, operation by introducing a parameter epsilon equal to either plus one or minus one. So uh, case lambda equals two minus epsilon square root of two gives me a minus lambda i gives me this first matrix here. And when I do Gaussian elimination, this is what I find. I have a missing pivot in the third location. Uh, setting, setting it equal to 1 gives me the eigenvectors for the two epsilon values, and I have my uh, vectors that all I need to do is change their length to 1 to find an orthonormal eigenvector basis. Here is the table uh, on the left. So I've got my three eigenvalues written in, multiplicity is equal to 1, the corresponding eigenvectors, my matrix was symmetric, uh, so eigenvectors for different eigenvalues are orthogonal, and if you check the dot products, yes, all three dot products here, S1, S2, S1 with S3, S2 with S3, all three of them work out to be zero. Uh, QR uh, simply uh, scales each one of the vectors to unit length, and so my lambda matrix uh, just copy down the eigenvalues, my Q matrix copy down the corresponding orthonormal eigenvectors. And finally, the uh, quadratic polynomial in this uh, form is two, three positive numbers. 2x1 tilde squared plus 2 minus square root of 2x2 two tilde squared plus 2 plus square root of 2x3 tilde squared. So if I think about the cross-section uh, problem, if I set this equal to 1, so this expression equal to 1, 
then uh, from calculus you will remember how to work this out. That that actually turns out to be an ellipsoid. Uh, the major axis uh, uh, you can compute the axis intersection by taking uh, x two tilde equal to zero, x three tilde equal to zero, and work out two x one tilde squared equal to. I chose one here, and so you get the intersections of the ellipsoid for each of the axes q1, q2, q3. And again, you will take the ellipsoid and replot it on top of the original coordinate system by simply taking uh, the original coordinate system, plotting q1, q2, q3 on that coordinate system, and then plotting the ellipsoid with respect to q1, q2, q3. For the extremum problem, I look at this expression here uh, and ask uh, what happens away from the critical point. I see I can't get any negative value out of it. At the critical point, I'm at zero, and away from the critical point, I'm at a point larger than zero. So the critical point is going to be a minimum for uh, this problem. And again, let me emphasize that what we did to go from the original quadratic form to the new quadratic form, that the substitution was x is equal to q x tilde. And here's my q. So uh, x is equal to this matrix times x1 tilde squared, x2 tilde squared, x3 tilde squared. And when you plug that in to the original equation, those up, that substitution, that is when uh, the whole thing collapses uh, to uh, an expression without cross terms. The quadratic surfaces that we see depend on the signs of the eigenvalues. The signs are important. And therefore, we have the following definitions in theory. If I look at my matrix A, and look at the quadratic form, x transpose AX, if the quadratic form is always greater than zero away from the critical point at the origin, we say that that matrix A is positive definite. If we allow zeros away from the origin, so I just don't see negative numbers away from the critical point, the matrix is positive semi-definite. If away from the origin we only see negative numbers, the matrix is negative definite. Uh, if you allow zero as well, negative semi-definite. And if I can get either positive or negative numbers, depending on where I move to from the origin, the matrix is said to be indefinite. And we know that that can be uh, rewritten in terms of the signs of the eigenvalues. So the theorem that goes with that uh, is written for the extremum problem and the eigenvalues. If I have all my eigenvalues greater than zero, that is, my matrix is positive definite, then x transpose ax, therefore, has a minimum at x equal to zero. If all the eigenvalues are less than zero, that is, when a is negative definite, then my quadratic form has a maximum at the critical point x equals zero. In the third case, if I have at least one negative and one positive eigenvalue, I know I can get both uh, negative and positive numbers out, out of my matrix uh, expression, then x transpose ax has a saddle point at x equals a. And one thing to remember is our uh, famous gram matrix, a transpose a, which we uh, developed it when we looked at the normal equation. If you check, a transpose A is positive semi-definite. It can't have negative eigenvalues. The tests for positive definite matrices. Since it's so important to decide whether or not the matrix is positive definite or negative definite, uh, we don't necessarily want to compute the, the eigenvalues. Uh, so, so different tests have been developed. And I'm going to need... Uh, a concept called the minors of a matrix, principal minors of a matrix. And basically, what a minor is, is if you take a matrix and you eliminate some rows and some columns, then what's left is a submatrix. Uh, and if you eliminate the same number of rows and columns in the square matrix, that submatrix is going to be square and therefore has a determinant. So the minor of a matrix is such a determinant. So I need some notation. 
I need to figure out which rows I'm keeping. I need to figure out which columns I'm keeping, and I'm going to keep the same number uh, of rows and columns, and uh, el uh, eliminate all the other rows and all the other columns, and compute the determinant of what's left. So, for example, if I keep rows 1 and 3, the first row and the third row, and columns 2 and 4, the second column and fourth column, then what I'm left with is submatrix 2, 4, 9, 11, and the minor corresponding to that is that determinant. The uh, next concept is that if I eliminate the same row and same column, if uh, I keep the same rows and the same columns, the same indices, I'm going to be talking about a principal minus. Principal minus have the diagonal terms of the matrix A on their diagonal, but not necessarily all of them. Right? So here, the principal minor that corresponds to one, two, and uh, to keeping rows one and two and columns one and two uh, is here uh, one, two, five, six. The last co uh, concept is the leading principal minus. Uh, that's the principal minus that I get as I grow my matrix. So, so the first one, just keep row one and column one, so just uh, the submatrix uh, containing one. The next one, uh, keep the first and second row and column. Uh, so I get uh, the matrix 1, 2, 5, 6. The next one, keep rows uh, 1, 2, 3 and columns 1, 2, 3. And so I get the next larger matrix all the way to the full matrix when I keep all of the rows and all of the columns. So those are the leading principal minors of the matrix. Here is a principal minor as opposed to a leading principal minor. I kept 1, 3, and 1, 3. So first column and third column, first row and third row, and so the matrix 1, 3, 9, 11. And again, uh, the diagonals are diagonal entries from the original matrix. So now here are my tests. And one thing about these tests is if you look on the web, you'll find a lot of people getting them wrong. Okay. Even some highly regarded textbooks have errors in them about those tests. You have to carefully consider the source and make sure you get them right. Uh, here are the tests for a positive definite uh, symmetric matrix. Well, the easiest test is to simply compute x transpose ax and try and figure out if it's greater than zero. If I give you x transpose ax equals x squared, then, yeah, that's positive definite. I can't get negative values out of it. I can't get zero out of it except that x equals zero. Uh, second test, compute the eigenvalues. If all of the eigenvalues are greater than zero, then my matrix is positive definite. Uh, the next test is more interesting, that the leading principal minors are all positive. So in my matrix here, if uh, the uh, determinant of 1 is, great, uh, is obviously greater than 0, the determinant of 1, 2, 5, 6 is greater than 0, if that's greater than 0. The next determinant, if that's greater than 0, if all of the leading uh, principal minors of that matrix are positive, then that matrix is uh, is positive definite. Uh, and these statements are all equivalent. So if that's not the case, the matrix would not be positive definite. Uh, the next one is that the uh, principal minors, if you go from one principal uh, minor to the next one, to the one that has one extra row and one extra column, that the pivots that you get on Gaussian elimination will actually be the quotient of those two minors. And so we can also express this uh, uh, leading principal minor idea in terms of Gaussian elimination. As long as I don't do any row exchanges and don't do any scaling, so I can change the uh, uh, values, I could scale out the minus sign otherwise. So if I don't do row exchanges and I don't do uh, scaling and I find that all my pivots are positive, then my uh, matrix is positive definitely. And the last one uh, comes from an LU decomposition. If I can find a matrix R 
uh, over the reels, the real entries, uh, such that R transpose R is equal to A, and the columns of R are linearly independent, then again, my matrix is positive definite. Positive semi-definite relaxes these conditions a little bit. So for positive semi-definite, I can allow zero values in X transpose AX uh, as well. I can allow the eigenvalues to be zero, so some of them can be zero, and all the others have to be positive. If I look at the minors, this time I have to look at all of the principal uh, minors, not just the leading principal minors. And that's one place where you'll find a lot of uh, statements to the contrary on the web, and it's just not true. The uh, pivot uh, story, I still can't do any scaling, uh, but uh, if I do Gaussian elimination and I find that all of the pivots uh, are positive, my matrix is positive semi-definite. And in terms of a matrix R, such that R transpose R multiplies R to A, this time I no longer require that R have linearly independent columns. Now, how about the opposite problem, uh, negative definite and negative semi-definite? Well, if A is negative semi-definite or negative definite, then minus A is positive definite or positive semi-definite. To uh, check whether a matrix is negative definite, I'll run the positive definite uh, test on minus A, and similarly for negative semi-definite. So here are a few examples uh, using these tests. Uh, so my first matrix uh, looked at the matrix 0, 0, 0, minus 1. And let's try and run each one of the tests on that matrix. Well, if I look at x transpose ax, it's equal to minus x2 squared. That's less than or equal to 0, since I could choose x2 equals 0 and x1 being whatever. And so a is negative semi-definite. If I look at the eigenvalues, well, uh, my matrix is triangular, so the entries on the diagonal are the eigenvalues, 0 and minus 1, and again my eigenvalue test says that A is negative semi-definite. If I look at the principal minors, well, I have to look at 0, I have to look at 0, 0, 0, minus 1, and I also have to look at minus 1 all by itself. So all of the possible uh, ways of dropping rows and columns uh, so that I keep the diagonal terms on the diagonal. And what I see then is that uh, for the first uh, term here, it's equal to zero. For the minor, uh, keeping just row two and column two, it's minus one, and therefore uh, A is negative semi-definite. In other words, I've done the, uh, the test for minus a. If I look at the row echelon form of minus a, well, I'm going to have to interchange those two rows, and with minus a, I have that minus 1 has been replaced by plus 1. I see that all my pivots are positive, so minus a is a positive semi-definite matrix, and therefore a is negative semi-definite. If I try and write minus A as a product, I see that I can write it as the matrix R, 0, 1, times the transpose of 0, 1. So again, minus A is positive semi-definite, which makes A negative semi-definite. Now, if you look at that, some of these tests might be easier to do than others. For example, here, the energy, uh, as physicists call X transpose A, X the energy, the energy here is obviously less than or equal to zero, and I obviously can get zero values out of it, so uh, A is negative, semi-definite, follows immediately. The eigenvalues are trivial to see. Principal minors, well, I've got three principal minors to consider, and I have to uh, play with whether or not A is uh, positive, uh, semi-definite, or negative, semi-definite. If I look at the row echelon forms, now, Gaussian elimination is simple. Uh, seeing the decomposition, uh, actually, normally you would 
uh, do the Gaussian elimination to uh, figure out what that uh, decomposition is. So which test to choose depends on the problem that we have on a case-by-case basis. For a second example, look at this matrix here. There is 1 minus 1 minus 1, 1. If we look at the eigenvalues, uh, well, uh, 1 minus 1 adds to 0, minus 1 and 1 adds to 0, so 0 is an eigenvalue, trace is 2, so 2 is the other eigenvalue. Eigenvalues are 0 and 2, so this matrix is positive, same I definite. If I look at the principal minors, I get 1, and then I get 0 for the next one. Uh, so uh, the leading principal minors are not all positive, uh, so that matrix is not positive definite. To check whether it's positive semi-definite, however, I need to check one more minor. I need to check that last one. Uh, so M22 is equal to 1. Now all my principal minors are non-negative, and so this uh, matrix A is indeed positive semi-definite. If you where to look at the previous example, why I'm saying that, uh, look at the minors here. The leading minors, the first one is 0, the second one is still 0, and as a consequence, I might be tempted to say it's positive semi-definite, but look at the last one. Uh, it consists of minus 1, it's negative, and that matrix is an example of why I have to uh, check all of the principal minors, not just the leading principal minors. The third example, then, look at this matrix here, 1, 1, 1, and it's got some value uh, A sitting in here. If I try and uh, factor the quadratic form, uh, I can actually do it. It turns out to be this expression squared plus A minus 1 times another square. So I can get both positive and negative values out of it, depending on the value of A. If A is greater than 1, then this expression here below this be positive or zero. I can choose x1, x2, x1 equals to minus x2, and x3 equal to zero, and I'd get uh, the value zero out of this expression. So it is positive, semi-definite. If I choose a less than one, then I can get both positive and negative values out of this expression. And therefore, the matrix uh, when A is less than 1 is indefinite. So one test, uh, trying to factor this, if I succeed in factoring it, uh, this test gave me the easy answer. If I look at Gaussian elimination without scaling, then the first row and the second row are the same. So the second row will uh, go to 0. And if I try and subtract off uh, the, the 1, I'll get an A minus 1 as the second pivot. So this is the matrix that I, uh, that I see. I don't have uh, the diagonal terms all greater than 0, so no, it's not positive definite, but I do have all my pivots positive or non-negative whenever A minus 1 is greater or equal to 0. And therefore, again, this uh, matrix here is positive semi-definite when A is greater than 1 uh, or equal to 1, and it's indefinite when A is less than 1. So our takeaway is that if I look at symmetric matrices, I know they can be diagonalized using an orthonormal set of basis vectors, and then I get A is equal to Q lambda Q transpose. And what we found today is that if we choose the substitution, X is equal to Q X tilde in a quadratic form, that that removes the cross terms. That when I plug in, I, get, uh, I no longer have any cross terms. I only have expressions that say first eigenvalue X1 tilde squared, second eigenvalue plus X2 tilde squared, adding all these terms uh, with just the squares of the x tilde as, as opposed to cross terms of the x tilde. Uh, the uh, last big concept we had today was positive definite, negative definite, indefinite, and uh, the uh, relaxed forms, the semi-definite forms of that. And the theorem that we saw is for that quadratic form, that when the matrix is positive definite, the critical point is a minimum. 
when the matrix is negative definite, the critical point is a maximum. And when the matrix is indefinite, when I can get both positive and negative values out of the quadratic form, I have, you have a satellite.